things I happen to love, a particular gem that uh, used in multiple places uh, called Factory Bot. Used to be called Factory Girl, and then Thoughtbot decided that you know it could be a little bit more inclusive, so renamed it to Factory Bot. Uh, so this gem is primarily being used for tests, and what it does is it's an alternative to fixtures. Fixtures is kind of like the default what uh, Rails gives you out of the box, but if you use Factory Bot, you can create the models. You can create the models and persist them to your database. So if you're relying a lot on callbacks or uh, after commit hooks or anything like that, you get a little bit more of a realistic um, realistic uh, expectations from your tests. You don't end up with, okay, this should work. Okay, it doesn't work in production. Why? What's gone wrong? Um, you can also use FactoryBot to help set up more complex relationships. So oftentimes if you have uh, has many or belongs to, sometimes there's um, uh, there's lots of stuff going on and you can help automate that so that when you create, uh, for example, you know, if you use uh, the generic uh, blog and post, uh, post needs to have a blog. So when you generate a post, it creates a blog for you. Or, you know, maybe you just assign it an existing blog. And the final thing is it just generalizes object creation. So if you're creating uh, the same objects over and over in your tests, you can use that. So instead of saying, okay, I need to create a user with a name. Well, does it need to have a different name every time? Could I just use the same name? Can I, do I have to type out the same name every time? You can put that all in your factory and it just will create it for you and away you go. So for an example of that, uh, this is actually from a project I started uh, not too long ago. Uh, it was basically the idea of a uh, fantasy hockey app. I'm just kind of curious and want to try and build it out. So we're going to be working with players and teams today. Uh, the idea behind this uh, model is it's a player, it belongs to a team, it's got a couple of statuses and uh, positions as uh, enums on it. It's nothing too crazy and it's not visible in this model because it's just on the, uh, in the database, but there is also an NHL ID, which comes from the NHL stats data. They've got an ID that makes it easier to fetch rather than trying to keep it in sync. Uh, so to create a factory for this model, it's pretty straightforward. Factorybot.define, give it call a factory player, and there's some magic going on in here. Uh, this factory player will automatically say, okay, is there a player model that I should use? And if there is, then I'll go and use that. You can create factories with different names and specify the model afterwards, but generally it's much simpler to just say, okay, here's my model, here's the same factory. Uh, I've given it a sequence for NHL ID because NHL ID should be unique. What this will do with factory bot is this sequence, every time you call this factory, it'll increment the sequence. So the first time you call the factory, NHL ID will be one. <coughs> Second time, it'll be two. Third time, it'll be three, and so on and so on until you run out of numbers, which I'm told can happen. Um, and then the last one that I added, because players need names, I added a name, and I'm actually using a, another gem here called Faker to just generate a random name. So. In practice, what this kind of looks like, I just have a binding pry and a series of tests I wrote here. Um, you can see that uh, you know I have some creates. If I create player, I've never seen a Miss Ashley Trantow, but apparently she plays in the NHL now. <laughs> um, so you can see that we've got an NHL ID of one, and if I call that create player again, uh, whoever Meredith Nicholas V is, um, they've got an NHL ID of two. Uh, you can see that I've got uh, status and position are empty because I haven't defined them in the factory, so they don't get any, any, uh, any value assigned to them. So when you're using factories, there's a couple of different ways you can uh, create them. The standard way is create. It will create and save it to your test database. So again, if I come back here and if I call player.count, I've got two players because I created two players. Very simple, very straightforward, it exists in the database. Uh, you can also use build. So maybe you're trying to test something uh, around your actual database save function. Maybe you have some sort of hooks in there. So you want to build it and validate that something is in one state, then save it and validate it's in another. So build will create it in memory. So it's essentially the same as calling .new. Uh, on a Rails model, but you haven't actually created the object yet. So if I do build player, uh, whoever Mitchell Efforts fourth is, these are actually spectacular names, way better than when I did my dry run. 
we can see that we've still got an NHL ID of three, but the ID is, doesn't exist because I'm just going to store this in a variable. Um, ID doesn't exist because it hasn't been persisted to the database. Player count is still two. If I call dot save on it, now it's been persisted to the database. It doesn't exist in the database until you've saved it. So that's what build can do for you. Uh, the other two I haven't used nearly as much. Um, attributes four, it will actually just return a hash. So particularly if you're doing anything in a controller, sometimes uh, using attributes four rather than creating the model for player. And Mundo Colpin. Seriously, these names are fantastic. Uh, so again, all it's done is it's returned the attributes that would be given to that object. You're not actually, this hasn't saved to the database, it hasn't even created an object for you. It's just said, here's some attributes, you can assign them wherever. And you can use that to create your object. So for... Uh, uh, yeah? No, it, yeah, so it's from a different gem uh, called Faker that uh, it's got a huge library of uh, assorted data and you can use it to randomize things like names, places. Yeah. For all sorts of things? Like yeah, I actually use it in a couple places. I also use it to generate team names. Really it's. Yeah, it'll do emails, it'll do corporate names. It'll do, it'll do video games, boxes. it'll do books, it'll do yeah. anything, so like pretty much anything. Yeah, and it will also, and it will also sometimes give you diacritics, which can be very useful if you are using a language like English where you don't have those, but you might have to deal with them in your actual application. It's not guaranteed, but possible. Is that the past three? What is the past three? No, it's no, a different gem. <laughs> yeah. So, for example, uh, name dot name. So yeah, so fac uh, Faker is just a completely different gem. You could actually do another presentation on Faker. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. <laughs> the, like it, it's it's actually bonkers how much uh, data is in that gem, and it's all in giant YAML files, and it'll randomly select one of whatever thing that you uh, ask for it. So the simplest way of using it is just like I said, Faker name dot name. So that's where those are coming from. I'm not. I don't have all these. Players. If I did, I would have probably picked actual hockey player names. <laughs> so, um, so again, attributes four will just give you, and you'll notice as well, even though this attributes four hasn't been saved. Sorry, I'm pointing at my screen and realizing you guys can't see that. <laughs> um, attributes four, uh, NHL ID is still getting incremented, even though player dot all, even though our player NHL ID stored in the database is only max set of three, our attributes four is now returning six because I've called this factory six times. So the final option that you can use is build stubbed. And just like it says here, the attributes are being stubbed out. I have not had as much use for this and I'm struggling to kind of think of a reason why I've been thinking on this last, since last night. Again, it's not persisted to the database, uh, but what will happen is if you're trying to do uh, mocks, I guess, this might be more beneficial. You can try and uh, hook into it and say, but you can do the same thing with a regular model as well. So I'm not, again. Do you want to hide your implementation inside the model from your test and just return like some result? Okay, thank you. You can also use it in your defaults too. Uh, it's not really a good idea. I yeah. Know, ideally, your tests don't want to. There are. I would I would argue that there's other options for improving speed, but yeah, build over create. Build over create sets versus lets. There's yeah. there's lots of options. Okay. Like maybe you. That seems to be wandering back into fixtures. I think. Yeah. 
Yes. Okay, because yeah, that would be the big. But if you've done anything otherwise, you might be entering into a, your own world of hell. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool. Today I learned the better use case for build stubbed. I. Probably would actually still argue against using build stub, but but it is an option and there is a purpose for it, so that's fantastic. So again, build stub doesn't save it to the database. Our player count is still three. So those are kind of like the four main ways that you can invoke factories. Um, one of the things with factories is even though I've specified the player, uh, even though I've got Faker telling me a name, sometimes I want to say, okay, I want to give them a specific name. And in this case, you can say, okay, uh, I'm going to pass you a name. And your object will then get the given name. So again, create player name. Let's pick an actual hockey player, even if he's retired. And we can see that we've created another player. And he's actually got the name Bjarmar Yager, as opposed to Philippe Miller. <laughs> uh, so, and you can do that with any attribute that's on the model. So I can create another Bjarmar Yager because his name is not uh, specific. And I can actually give him the status of active, I believe. Yeah, so now because I've specified the status, even though it's not specified on the factory, it's now been set properly on the created model. So you can use that, your factory should generally be the most generalized data, the data that you absolutely need to have. Whereas if you need this particular piece of data for these tests, you can then specify it in that test as opposed to having to specify it on the factory level. So associated objects, we kind of touched on it briefly. Um, as I mentioned, I also have a model called team. Teams need players. If you don't have any players on a team, you don't really have a team. Uh, one way you can do that is you can call create half a dozen times and give it a team. And similar because I've set up the associations, if, uh, sorry, I'm just going to continue and clear this out. Um, so if I create a team, the New York Zebras. Seriously, factory error faker is great for some very interesting uh, data. Uh, I can create a player and, sorry, I know how to type. And I can specify the team, same that way that I would uh, on, uh, if I was creating the model in Rails. And now we can see that Clement Hedinger, t.team, his team is the New York Zebras. Uh, so I can do that six times and this will pass, but it doesn't seem to be actually helping us with the drying up of things. So FactorBot actually does offer us some uh, helper methods to manage this. They have this thing called create list and what that will do is you can pass the create list to factory and give it a number and it will create however many of that factory. So exactly the same way that uh, if you called create six times, create list, pass a player in six, we'll create six players. And if you pass additional arguments to it, such as team is team, uh, in this situation, you'll end up with six players assigned to that team. So, create list, player, and I'm, oh, and I'm actually just gonna say five because we already created one. Dr. Catherine Goldner, <coughs> T t.players.size, and we've got six players for them. And if we call t.players, we can see Clement Hedinger, uh, Catherine Goldner, 
all these people that we created that are now part of this team. So that's helpful, but if you're creating a lot of teams, you're going to need a lot of players. So you can actually you can actually create this via traits. And so here I've got my factory for team and NHL ID, Faker team name, conference division, and I've passed it, given it a trait called full roster. And what that will do is after it finishes creating the team, it will then go and create a list of six players for the team. And again, it works exactly the same as if I'd uh, called create list separately, but if I call create team and pass it the trait full roster, Tennessee lycanthropes. I kind of want to cheer for them now. <laughs> We've got six players for this team, and six different players, and not the same six that we've created before. So we've got Miss Fern Hemiston, Jacinda, I don't even want to try and pronounce that. Um, so yeah, basically it's given us a, a shorthand to creating large, large sets of data. So one more thing with that is transient attributes, which is kind of like a default value for some of these traits. Uh, specifically, for example, if we have a team, six players is enough to ice a team. It's not actually a full NHL roster. But it's good enough for a default set of data. If I wanted to, though, I could tell it, I can give it this additional attribute, roster count. And here I've set it to six. So the default value is going to be six. But because I've specified this roster count, every time I call trait full roster, I can also specify roster count and give it a new value. And that value will be what's passed down to this create list with this player evaluator dot roster count and pass it to team. So similarly here, if I call full roster and roster count, oh, I'm starting to go. If I say 15, for example, Vermont Griffins, t dot players dot size, we've got 15 players. So it's an easy way to kind of say, OK, there's sometimes that, um, for example, if you have uh, properties and you need to have a number that have a location, but you don't care about the location, except for in certain situations, you can say, OK, give me a location, but don't worry about the, lo the coordinates. OK, now I need a location, and I need it to be at this specific like coordinate set. So you can, uh, again, it's like setting a default, but allowing yourself to override it without having to go in and say, OK, I've created my team, and now you know, create this. And I've created this object, and now change these attributes to be this so that we can make it work. Does that all make sense so far? So one more thing you can do is you can use factories within factories. So again, we're coming back to this player factory. And I kind of lied earlier. One of the things that's required for my players is they have to be on a team. Doesn't make sense actual in real reality, but it's how I set up my database and I need to fix that. So one thing that I can do is I can actually tell, tell FactoryBot that you have an association to team. And similar to how the magic, if I call factory player, it'll go and find a model called player. If I say association team, it's going to go look for a factory called team. And what this will do is it'll create a team for me every time I look and create a player. So if I go player equals create player. Note, I have not specified the team for this player. Uh, Helga Dibbert is part of the New Jersey worshipers. <laughs> OK. <laughs> go worshipers. Uh, so again, I've. A team has been implicitly created for this factory. This can be good and bad. Uh, as mentioned previously, if you have a lot of these associations, if, for example, you have something that's nested five levels deep and each factory needs to create its parent over and over again, it's probably not going to be super efficient and it's probably not going to be effective. So it really depends on how your project is set up, how your database, what, what, you've, what you've specified as being required. Could you have a player without a team? Yes. Can I have a player without a team? No, because I didn't set up my database right. But going forward, you probably want to break that association just so that you can say, going forward, I don't need to worry about this player having a team. 
And in some situations, the player is not going to have a team. So I don't need this association. I don't necessarily want this every time. Please don't go and create a team every time I create a player. It's not helpful. One thing to note is even though I've got a team now for Helga Dibbert, if I specify, so for example, if I go team.count, we've got five teams. If I create another player team and I pass it the worshipers, so Jenny Lank DVM, okay. If I call team, this person's still part of the worshipers and the team.count has not changed. So because I've told it, I've given it a specific uh, team to be associated with, it's not going to go and create that implicit associated object. It's going to say, oh cool, you have a team, I don't need to create one, everyone's happy. So that is one way if you do need those associations, you can create that one parent object and assign it to all of your child objects. Again, depends on how you're working with your, uh, uh, how your project is set up. And that's kind of everything I wanted to cover. There is definitely a lot more with FactoryBot, but that's kind of a high level overview and some of the cool things. I know uh, some people I've encountered are familiar with FactoryBot, aren't familiar with the transient attributes, which are really, really cool and crazy useful. Um, so yeah, hopefully you learned something. If not, hopefully somebody learned something. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, any other questions or? I mean, you could use some random YAML and load that and... <laughs> there, there used to be one called Tashima, which was created after Factory Boy. But I don't know if it's still maintained. I, I'm actually was migrating. Uh, I had used Tashima for this originally, and I was migrating it, uh, doing some migration to Act 90 stuff, but from some still residual Tashima stuff into Factory. Yeah, I, it's definitely one of the things like FactoryBot I think has become like the de facto if you're not using uh, fixtures. Uh, there might still be other options, but most- It may still be around. The, the, the DSL I thought for machinists was slightly better, but FactoryBot just got more and more functionality and eventually got to the point where the stuff like the traits and stuff like that, you couldn't do that in machinists. And so, Yeah. An interesting point about the attribute store. Mm -hmm. I used it quite a bit for doing um, uh, API testing when you're doing JSON structure. Yeah, controller testing would be a big one, especially if you're saying like, okay, I need to test my create, rather than yeah. having a model then and then saying, okay, it's a good way to say, okay, I need some randomized data, get me some attributes. I don't really care about the content, but it should create a model that looks like this. Yeah, if you had a model that was constantly fetching from an API, that might not be a yeah, good design pattern, though. Test it, like yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Ben? Uh, kind of a two-part question. So uh, one of the things you demonstrated was sequence, mm -hmm. where it's auto-incremented. Auto of course, that in order to do that, you need to preserve state. And the state that will be affected by the operation test can get interacted with other tests. And also, um, you do something like fake or you're introducing like random mm -hmm. So what are your views on those mitigating those effects? So yeah, you are definitely introducing uh, some degree of uh, 
uh, dependence between your tests if you use sequence. Uh, one thing to combat that is, you know, don't don't do an expect uh, don't expect the NHL ID to be four. That's generally not a good practice because there's no guarantee if someone adds a test before that. Especially uh, if you're starting a fairly new project, you might in, uh, enforce the random ordering of uh, RSpec runs or whatever testing framework you have, which is a good way to kind of catch that kind of stuff because it's really easy to kind of fall in that pitfall of, oh, the sequence is always going to be two. And then you run it with 15 other tests and suddenly the sequence is not two at all and it's never going to be two again. Uh, generally, it's just not a good practice to say, okay, unless you set something to be a very spe specific value, don't test that it's looking for that specific value. Look for something, um, you know, expect it to either be a number or if you're making sure that maybe that sequence isn't being modified, test to make sure that, hey, I created this model and make sure it's unchanged. There's lots of ways to work around that rather than saying like, make sure this is four or make sure this is seven. And what was the second half? Right. So again, most, most of the time with tests, adding some degree of randomness is going to be actually more helpful than not. Um, because again, you shouldn't be testing that, okay, uh, give me a random name and name should be John Doe. It just doesn't make that much sense. So again, similar to that, just try and protect your tests from uh, requiring to always be that same value. And you can make it so that, okay, expect this to be a string. It should be set. It should not be nil. But it, not necessarily that it needs to be John Doe or something specific. Yeah? Um, if I may go back to the slide that you showed the player and the four assigned to your team. Um, like implicit creation or? Because. Um. Here's six players that are assigned to a team. Okay. So my, my question is, um, so you mean when you create the player, you were assigned to a team, right? Yes. Um, so is it random to assign to a team? Or? No. So yes and no. <laughs> so again, in this situation here, I've created a team. And then when I'm creating this player, these players, I'm telling it that this is your team. So. I'm removing that randomness. The team is going to be a random object, but all of these players are going to be part of the same team. Whereas here, because I don't specify the team, it's going to create a brand new team for me, and I have no idea what that team looks like. And I'd actually have to say, OK, player.team to see that team. Does that make sense? Yeah. Each of those six players had a different new team. But because she passed in the team that she just created in the line above, all those players will be assigned to that team. So yeah, there I just did uh, create list player six. And you can see it might be tough to see because I'm using UIDs. But this team ID is not the same as this team ID. And if I go and players.map team. We've got Massachusetts Vixens, the Montana Dolphins. Wow, they're really lost. Uh, Mississippi Fishes, <laughs> New York Camaras, Wyoming Dogs, Idaho Rabbits. Every player in that situation has gotten a different team because I haven't told FactoryBot that here's the team that these guys all belong to. Because I haven't told them what team to belong to, it's going to create a team for each one of those players. Yeah, unless I've specified, unless I've told FactoryBot that this is the team these guys should belong to, okay. I'm going to have no idea what team it's going to come up with. And, and even the first team you install, which is called create team, you don't know what the name is going to be. Yeah. Or not the division. I mean, it's set up through that figure. Uh, yeah, because I'm. Um, as long as you don't care, right? Yeah. yeah. If you care, then what would happen? If you want to assign it to. So, for example, if I want to create an actual NHL team, uh, I can give it the name. Okay. And now I've got the Edmonton Oilers. They're still in the wrong conference and division because I didn't specify that. Yeah. So does that does that uh, kind of clarify things? Yeah. Is 
they're at least they're in the right conference now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I've seen that strategy, and I'm not a fan. <laughs> yeah, you, you can argue, make arguments for it, for sure. That's faster, though, because you don't create as much as you need it. Yeah, but you're adding some dependencies <laughs> that... Well, well, well it's, you could make it optional, too. I've yeah. done that as well, right? If, if something doesn't exist, create... Grab something from the database, yeah. yeah. And that, that is an option, like I said. Uh, it's not one I'd personally recommend, because I've been burned by it a few times. <laughs> But Donald? Oh, yeah, I guess uh, if I can type continue. Um, so yeah, here's, I've got, like I said, this is just a project that I've uh, created a few uh, weeks back, 25th of March apparently. Um, so I've got all my uh, usual uh, folders. If I go into spec, I've actually created a factories um, folder and inside of the factories folder, uh, some people like to create a single factory.rb file. Other people like to have uh, multiple factories files. Depends on kind of again, what do you need? If you have 50 or 60 different models that you're creating factories for, I'd recommend using uh, individual files just to keep them kind of sane. If you've only got four, then you can probably get away with just using a single .rb file. Um, and then there are Rails generators, which I almost never use. Um, I don't know if I have another object here. If you include it, I'm trying to think. The, the generator is handy when you do the full, um, you know, the full generate. Because yeah. once you've got it, then it'll generate the, which, which uh, will give you at least the framework Let's sure it, see. Uh, I think it actually fleshes out the, um, the list of them as well. You can do, you can do oh, whoops. It'll, yeah, it'll yeah so the, my, create an individual uh, uh, factory file for you. Mine's not quite set up. I did, I did just do the model, but I probably because it's only, if I use scaffold, I believe it will integrate properly. Okay, so what have we got? Uh, R spec. No, it didn't. Yeah, it didn't create it. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, controllers, views, routing, quests, helpers. Yeah, I think. You can, you can definitely, you, you definitely can tie it into the scaffold. It's just something I don't do because I almost never use the generator. <laughs> Yeah. But, yeah, I know. Yeah, it could be, again, this is uncharted territory for me because I almost never use the generators. I find. Yeah, I know. It, I just find it creates a lot of garbage for me and I end up having to rewrite the files anyway. <laughs> but teach their own. It is included in development, so. Okay, man. Da, 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 da. So yeah, you can see I've got in both development and test. Factory bots included. Oh, because I don't have factory bot rails, that's why. Yeah. Ah, yes. That would be why. That would be why, yeah. So that's, uh, that would be why it's not working and why I didn't notice it wasn't working that way. So yeah, any other questions around factory bot or?